First off, Happy New Year's to all of you guys. Happy New Year's, Happy Holidays. Hope you guys had a great Christmas or whatever you celebrate. Our Christmas tree is still up, but that's not saying much since we have it up all year long. It's called the all season tree in our house and it gets decorated for each holiday. We had a Halloween tree, Thanksgiving tree, we get the spring tree. Sometimes we just decorate it for the season if there's no particular holiday. <clears throat> so, um, thank you to the Minnesota State Arts Board and the National Endowment for the Arts for supporting this live stream and supporting this educational material. Um, how to pitch your book to agents, publishers, um, acquisitions, editors, people who buy books, book ideas, people who publish books. What's up, Jen? Hope you guys are doing well in uh, Down Under. Good eye, mate. Are you guys in Australia or New Zealand or one of those two? New South Wales? You guys are just globe trotting all over the place. Inspirational is what it is. Perfect Instagram globe trotting couple. Makes me jealous. Okay, so moving on. <clears throat> what are my qualifications to be talking about this? I want to make sure my mission is to learn things about how to be an independent storyteller and then share that stuff with you guys. I want to help you on your journey. I want to make the videos that I wish were there for me on my learning journey that could have made things faster. I, I go down rabbit holes, I learn things, and I come back and I share what I've learned with you because I want to empower you guys. I want to see the stories that you want to create. I want to read the books that you want to write. Your inspiration, and your creativity inspires me and uh, motivates me to keep going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to make it easier for you guys to share your creativity. So my qualifications uh, in this subject. I am a National Endowment for the Arts winning, grant winning author. I'm working on a series of horror novels. You can see I'm wearing my, sweat, my uh, outfits from named after my first novel, Northport 1999. My first novel, by the way, is up for an award at the Catalyst Content Festival, the world's largest TV festival. And the same is true for the season one TV show pitch that I wrote based on the novel and the pilot episode screenplay that I wrote adapted from the novel. Um, and I'm here to say that if I can do this stuff, so can you guys. And I'm going to give you the steps on how to do pitching your book. I have pitched my novels multiple times, including at a really fascinating pitching festival called Pitcherama, uh, which I will tell you about in detail. As a result of pitching my stuff, my novels, I am now working with an independent publishing company um, on my series of novels, and they're going to be publishing them. Right now, they're exclusively available on patreon.com forward slash Bodhi the Movie Maker. That's how you can read them and support my work. But I'm going to be publishing them through this independent publishing company, and that all came about through these, this pitching uh, technique information that I'm going to be sharing with you. So that's, that's me. That's why I'm talking about this. <clears throat> so, do, 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 do. first things first. Does a book need to be complete to begin pitching? Answer, no, not really. In fact, traditional publishing through a conventional publisher pretty much necessitates that your book is going to be changing, your manuscript is going to be adjusted along the way before it actually reaches publication. But that doesn't mean that you don't want to have a complete draft of your book. 
you want a complete draft of your book that is professionally edited before you start sending out your manuscript to the people you might be pitching to. <clears throat> Let's uh, define the different types of people you might want to be pitching to. We've got literary agents, publishers, and then the people who sort of buy books for publishing companies, you know, the editors. Um, how do we find the people to pitch to, to send our query letters to? And I'll be getting into defining what a query letter is in a second here. The main answer is researching books that are similar to the one you're writing. Find authors who've written books like the one you're working on and then look through their book on the copyright page, in the back matter, the special thanks, uh, the back cover, and look at the publishing company. And you could possibly find their literary agent in the special thanks. Um, and then, you know, pro tip, use that personal connection information to reach out to them and say, hey, I really liked your work on this book, you know, insert title here. Um, because you worked on that book, I think you might be interested in mine. So, uh, jumping ahead a little bit here, but this is relevant. When you reach out to people via email, agents, publishers, it's great to say you came highly recommended. Um, I did my research and you seem like the perfect person to be talking to. I've heard specifically from my publisher friend, who's also an author, you might want to refrain from saying who recommended you to reach out to this person. Like let's say you, you talk to your publisher friend and they give you a list of literary agents and other publishers to reach out to. Well if you say my publisher friend so and so recommended that I reach out to you and send you my book, you might want to publish it. The first thing that person's thinking is, well, why did so-and-so pass on your book? Why did so-and-so not want to publish it? You know, it doesn't, so name dropping is always, you know, we think it's going to give us some more credibility, but why didn't that name that you just dropped want to work with you is sometimes the takeaway that happens there. So it's better to be vague and uh, about who kind of introduced you to recommended that you reach out to this specific publisher or literary agent, but instead say that you found them through your own research, researching books that you think are like yours, that apply to the same market that yours will, that attract to the same type of reader that yours will. So let's talk about query letters and book proposals. <clears throat> the difference between the two. Uh, book proposals and query letters serve distinct purposes in the process of getting books published, particularly in the traditional publishing industry. Here are the key differences and similarities between the two. A query letter, the purpose, is to pique the interest of a literary agent or acquisition editor and entice them to request more materials, such as a sample chapter, a synopsis, or the full manuscript. The content of a query letter, it has a brief overview, providing a concise introduction to your work, including the title, genre, and word count, a hook or personalization, it often includes a hook element to capture the recipient's attention, synopsis, a brief summary of the book is included, providing an overview of the main characters and the central conflict that drives your story. Then there's an author bio, a short bio, highlighting relevant credentials, achievements, or personal connections to the material. And then in closing the letter, we'll have polite expressions of appreciation and an offer to provide more materials and the author's contact information, lastly. So that's a brief description of what you get in a query letter. And that, for us non, for us fiction writers, that's what we're going to be focusing on, but let's talk about a book proposal. 
The purpose of a book proposal is a comprehensive document designed to provide a detailed and thorough overview of a non-fiction book project, typically. And it usually used, is used for non-fiction work, especially in academic, self-help, or niche markets, cookbooks, stuff like that. The content. Uh, an introduction section that usually includes information about the author's background and qualifications to write the proposed book. An overview of the book, including its title, genre, target audience, and the problem or question the book addresses. It's got market analysis, essentially a discussion of the target market, including the audience and competing works, comparable works, to establish the book's commercial viability. Unique selling points, an exploration of the unique aspects that make the book stand out in the market. Then there's a table of contents that outlines the structure and contents of the book. Then we talk about the author platform, which actually I would argue you want to put this in your query letters as well nowadays. What is an author platform statement? It's basically information about the author's platform including their online presence, social media following, and speaking engagements. Platform means what is your audience, how do you reach them, how do you sustain them, how is it growing. If you're a public speaker, then that's your main platform. If you're a social media influencer, then that's your main platform. I'm going to get back to that, but let's finish talking about uh, book proposal components. The next one is comparable titles, a list and analysis of comparable titles in the market to demonstrate where the book fits within the existing landscape. Some people even use the language, you might find my book on the shelf in between, you know, Barefoot Contessa and The Country Cook, you know, if it's a cookbook. Manuscript status and timeline, information on the current status of the manuscript and an estimated timeline for completion. Conclusion, a polite closing, expressing gratitude and openness to provide additional materials and answer any questions, and of course your contact information. So let's go back to the author platform. I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but one of the things that I took away from my early pitching experiences was that even in the fiction realm that I'm in, where the manuscript is supposed to sort of stand for itself. The merit of the writing is supposedly the most important thing. Really, when you're pitching and talking to publishers, it's revealed, and agents especially, it's revealed that they really care most about, like, your platform. What's your audience? What's the built-in audience that's going to buy this book, that's going to justify their investment. And yeah, you know, it can be kind of jarring at first because a lot of people come in from the outside, imagine that a publisher, their purpose is to cultivate the audience for you. But nowadays things have shifted where that's not necessarily always the case. And uh, they want an easy bet, you know, they want a, uh, a sure thing investment or as close to one as they can. So the more you can grow your platform, your audience, the way you engage with them, uh, the better. You know, social media, YouTube, public speaking engagements. Um, you gotta leverage those things and build those audience numbers because that speaks uh, louder than the quality of your writing is is sometimes the takeaway you can feel when you're pitching to agents and publishers because you'll you'll give a really nice pitch with uh, very artfully describing hitting all of those important points that we just read in the query letter which are very similar to what you would do in a verbal pitch or at least the ones that I've done and then at the end you know they're really interested in like talking about your platform Anyways, so let's talk about the similarities between a book proposal and a query letter because they are different. They both should have a professional tone uh, and they should be very polished. You don't want any typos in either of them. 
since they're the document you're sending to the literary industry. Author's bio, they both often include a brief author's bio. Uh, contact information. In summary, both query letters and book proposals aim to capture the interest of agents or publishers. A query letter is shorter and more focused uh, for introducing a fiction work to the reader and aiming to prompt a request for more materials. Usually you don't send it with your full manuscript. In contrast, a book proposal is a detailed document primarily used for nonfiction works, providing comprehensive information to help publishers assess the potential of the project, which you could, you could uh, replace the word project with product. It's not a bad way of thinking about it. And that's the world of conventional publishing, query lettering, book proposaling, is you're making a product and you're finding the market and uh, that's, that's what they're buying into. So are book proposals for fiction a thing? Since we just, uh, I just said that, you know, book proposals are primarily for uh, nonfiction works. While book proposals are more commonly associated with nonfiction works, they are generally not a standard requirement for fiction submissions in traditional publishing industry. Fiction manuscripts are typically submitted to a literary agent or publisher with a query letter and in some cases a specified number of sample chapters or the full manuscript. I'll be getting back to that in a bit. Fiction submissions are often evaluated based on the strength of the writing, the narrative, and the potential market appeal of the story, which can be heavily judged by like how many followers do you have? That is your first market. Um, <clears throat> Some agents or publishers may request additional information such as a synopsis or an author bio along with query letter and sample chapters, which is common. Uh, always follow the submission guidelines provided by the specific agent or publisher you are querying. So when you find a publisher or an agent, someone recommends them to you, look them up, look up their website. They're always going to have their submission requirements listed on under their like reach out to me page or whatever their submission page and usually it's like I want the first 30 pages or I want the best chapter um, I want two chapters they'll give you very specific requirements and it's good to not just send out a you know like an email blast and cc all of the or blind cc all of the uh people you want to send it to and just send one generic one because they see that right away and uh that can disqualify you if they can tell or at least their secretary or the person who combs through their emails can tell you didn't follow their submission guidelines <clears throat> You gotta keep in mind, one of the things that a publisher told me is like, the people who are reading your query letters are overworked, tired, they've been at this for a week already, reading maybe hundreds of these a day. They're looking for any reason to discount you. And so if you're not following their requirements listed on their website to the T, that's an easy way for them to uh, just move on, make their life easier. Um, so try to think about the fact that even though ideally you're talking to the, to the publisher or an editor down the line, probably the first person to open and read your email and look at that first line and decide whether or not they're going to continue is like an overworked query letter reader. All right. So this is an important point to emphasize. There is no one size fits all query letter or book proposal. Publishers and literary agents typically have submission guidelines that they expect authors to follow then uh, when submitting manuscripts or queries. These guidelines are essential for ensuring that submissions are organized and meet the expectations of the professionals reviewing them. Submission guidelines may vary among different agents and publishers. So it is crucial 
to carefully read and adhere to the specific instructions provided by each. Here are some common elements included in submission guidelines. Query letter requirements. Some agents and publishers request a query letter in the initial contact. This letter often includes a brief introduction, a concise overview of the book, and a short author bio. By the way, I'm going to have templates for the query letter, the um, book proposal, and I am even going to read my verbal pitch to you guys at the end here. So let's keep flying through here. Another thing in the requirements, manuscript format. Specific instructions regarding formatting, font size, spacing, and document type for electronic submissions or hard copies if applicable. Probably not anymore. Sample chapters or full manuscript. Clear guidelines on how many sample chapters should be included or whether they prefer to receive the entire manuscript. Also unlikely. Genre and though it's usually if they show interest after your first query letter, they'll ask for the entire manuscript. It's usually not requested in the very first correspondence. Genre and content preferences. Information about types of books or genres the agent or publisher is interested in and representing or publishing. They make that very clear. It's like in, the t in their job title. Young adult agent. Or usually they say, like, I'm interested in young adult and, or cookbooks or, you know, women authors. I'm looking for BIPOC young adult sci-fi. Sometimes they drill way down. If they're not interested in your genre, don't send it to them. It's that simple. Um, they don't want it. They don't like it. You could send them an email saying, hey, do you know anybody who's interested? Here's my genre. If so, please, like, forward this. I know you're not interested in that. You could. Um, can't get things if you don't ask for them. So, not saying follow every single rule to the T. <clears throat> so they'll also give you guidelines about your author's bio sometimes. Uh, response time. Typically they'll let you know how long it's going to take to hear back from them in the, they'll give you a window. Uh, I've heard back from a publisher saying, you know, six months at least. And it, it did turn out to be six months. <laughs> it's there, you know, that's life. So uh, exclusive submissions, some agents or publishers may request exclusive submission rights for a specific pe period, meaning that the author should not submit the same work to multiple agents and publishers simultaneously. Simultaneous submissions. Uh, some um, information about whether simultaneous submissions are accepted or discouraged. So only send me one book at a time. Submission platform. Instructions on how and where to submit, whether through email or they might have an online submission form or by snail mail, perhaps. And then they'll let you know if there's any other specific material they need. So it's crucial to research the submission guidelines of each publisher or agent individually and to research them and who they are, their background, what kind of work they are interested in, what kind of work they've done, maybe what field they were in before they became a, a literary agent or whatever. It's great to know who you're talking to. Personalize it. So, okay, query letter template. I'm going to just briefly synopsize it, but I'm going to make a link available to this. Um, I'm going to post it after this video, this live stream is done. I will post it on, in, I'll put a link in the comments on Facebook, YouTube, and Patreon. Wait, never mind. Yes, yes I will. That's what I'm going to do. So, after this live stream is over, there will be a link to the free templates of the query letter book proposal. Whew, good fun. Okay, so it starts off with your contact information, then of course the, the name of the person you're sending it to, their publishing house or agency and their address. Then it's very formal, dear Mr., Ms., Mrs., last name. I hope this letter finds you well, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So then 
paragraph one, we got introduction. We already talked about that. Paragraph two, synopsis. Paragraph three, author bio. Paragraph four, marketing and audience. What book is this like? Who might it appeal to as far as your audience research goes? You want to have extensive research into who your reader is. Um, I've heard from a literary agent that they, that they don't like it when an author sends them a query letter that says, my book is like the Da Vinci Code or a book that sold. They want it to be like books that sold really well, but they kind of also don't want it to be like the, the best in any genre because they discount that as like the easiest possible choice you could have made to uh, a lot to say, oh, my book is in this genre. So it's like, and then you choose the most popular one. There's a few different reasons they don't like that. So you might want to get a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more modern with your research and really go look at bookstores and on Amazon and find something not the very top of the market, but something more reasonable. And I, I, I won't say that I won't speak for all the literary agents out there, but one of the ones that I queried, I heard somebody else doing a verbal pitch to her and she mentioned that like saying your book is like something at the very top of the market. Um, even if it's true, kind of scares them off for a few different reasons. Okay. Chapter five, there's a closing expressing your appreciation and letting them know, you know, Hey, if you're, interested, I can send you more. Thanks for your time. Sincerely, your full name and your signature if it's a physical letter. Okay, book proposal template. Same thing, we got your contact information, then we got your, you know, you're formally addressing this letter out to the person you're reaching out to. Quick little like, hello, then it's introduction about yourself, overview of your book, target audience, the unique selling points of your book. So what sets it apart from the others in your niche, uh, table of contents about, your, uh, about the different contents of your book. Then we're going to paragraph six, talk about your author platform, paragraph seven, comparable titles or, uh, you know, your, um, competition paragraph eight, the status of your manuscript and the timeline to completion paragraph nine, the conclusion, which is again, just thanking them for their time. And then you sign it sincerely, your name. Okay, so let's talk about a verbal pitch. Let's fly through the rest of this. We're nearly to the end. When we're talking about a verbal pitch, let's use the query letter as a frame of reference to define some of the key aspects of a verbal pitch. A verbal pitch and a query letter serve the same fundamental purpose to introduce your book and persuade an agent or editor to show interest. However, they differ in format and delivery. And just like when you look up a literary agent or a publisher's website and they say, submit your book here. And then they tell you the specifics requirements, each different verbal pitching situation has different requirements. Um, you might be pitching at some sort of a pitch competition or a pitch festival. In that case, they're going to have their guidelines spelled out or they're going to leave them vague by choice. Usually they're going to have a time limit and sometimes it's going to be a give and take you pitch and then you hear feedback in real time and you converse. In that case, you want to keep your pitch as short short as possible to save time in your allotted time slot for that feedback. And then sometimes you're just in an elevator and that's your pitch. Like you gotta, you gotta use the moment you have carpe diem. Sometimes you meet somebody in a bar. You never know <clears throat> the back of a horse carriage on a carriage ride. It's happened. True story. Um, so verbal pitching is a great thing to practice even just as an exercise. So, because it gets you ready to on the fly, if you do ever have that one 
maybe once in a lifetime opportunity, you're in an elevator with a literary agent or you're in a, in a horse carriage, you know, with a producer and writer from a Hollywood TV show. If you've practiced, you could be ready. And this is verbal pitching is a great way to, to get that going. So again, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the ways that verbal pitching differs from query letters and some of the ways that they are similar. Obviously a query letter is written and a verbal pitch is spoken, uh, which means you're physically presenting your book idea and delivering it in person over the phone or virtually, which is very common such as during a pitch session at a writing conference or at the pitching competition at Catalyst Content Festival. So um, because it's oral, it involves spoken communication and it requires effective verbal communication skills, including tone, pace, and enthusiasm. And those can go a long way to uh, keep their attention which they're probably tired by the time they hear from you, so make it easier for them. Detail and depth. Query letters are able to be much more detailed depending on how long uh, the query letter format you get to fill out, usually about a page. Verbal pitching, much more concise. So it necessitates focusing on the most compelling aspects of your story and who you are. Um, flexibility, query letter, it's got a fixed amount of space. Verbal pitching can be dynamic. Things can change in the fly. Maybe you get a little bit more time. Maybe, uh, maybe you get less and you got to just immediately respond to that. Personal connection. Query lettering is indirect. You're not looking them in the eyes and you're conveying your personality through your writing style, your choice of words, um, establishing a connection, you know, through your writing content, your writing voice, <clears throat> which um, is not the same immediate connection you get with the spoken verbal pitching and you get to communicate your passion and the enthusiasm for your project through your vocal expression. Um, while both verbal pitching and query lettering achieve the same goal of capturing the interest, hopefully, of a literary agent or editor, uh, we get the ways that they differ. And uh, so, in the same way that each publisher, editor, agent has different submission requirements for query letters, each verbal pitching situation will have different requirements. We got that. For example, though, here's a really cool pitching thing that I was able to do, uh, have been doing for a few years now, Pitcherama, which is hosted by the WNBA SF chapter. No, not the basketball organization. The WNBA stands for the Women's National Book Association. And they place, uh, I remember, approximately five minutes, it might be three, um, a five to th three to five minute cap on each verbal pitch. So essentially you get like, you get five authors in this like Zoom call and then a publisher comes in um, and one at a time you pitch to them. And so they recommend that you take up like less than half or only slightly more than half of your allotted time so that you can get their feedback. So you really got to hone your pitch. You got to time it. You got to practice it. Um, and it's a great way to learn and you get their immediate feedback. You can see if they're bored. You can see if they're looking at their watch, getting distracted. Um, and then you get to hear their thoughts and their improvements and suggestions. Quick note, uh, the WNBA, um, you can, regardless of gender identity, you're, you can go pitch there. I have done it multiple times. I really enjoyed practicing my pitching there. So definitely check that out. WNBA Pitcherama. Um, I will also share a link to their specific notes. They go into great detail about the types of pitch they want and like 
they give a lot of really good pointers about how to present yourself virtually through a Zoom call, like do great lighting, make eye contact with the camera, not yourself on the screen. A lot of stuff that uh, I guess some people don't think about. Me, on the other hand, I mean, look at, look at this. Look at this lighting. No, I'm just kidding. This is how you learn these things is through Picturama. And I learned a lot of great stuff. Um, they make it much more conversational. Even though it's Picturama, they really want you to be more ad-libbed, more improvised. You have your script down, memorized. You have it printed out. You have it on your screen. But you allow yourself flexibility because each time you pitch, you're going to hear feedback. And you might implement that feedback next time. So your pitch might be growing and evolving. Which is really just a microcosm of what happens at like a festival. You know, you're meeting people, you're talking about your project, you're hearing their thoughts, you're hearing what might have confused them. They might ask a question for clarification and then you realize, oh, I should explain that next time. Or I should say it differently so people get it. Uh, <clears throat> so I will read you my pitch now and then we'll wrap it up and then all of these templates will be available for free. You just have to sign up for my newsletter. So if you guys haven't done that yet, how about this? Go sign up there. I'm gonna put up my newsletter sign up QR code on the screen right now. I'll also, um, let's see, another way you can get there is just by going to northportstory.com forward slash audition. That's another way to get to my newsletter, but uh, I'm gonna have both of those up on the screen right now. One of the things that I did for my literary pitch is that I, I used my illustrations because I actually have um, you know, great illustrations of each character and the monsters and stuff. I'm not gonna do that the exact same way I did it for mine for my pitch, but I would hold these up to the camera and I'd have really nice lighting and they liked that and it was something that kept their attention. And so you'll hear as I'm doing my pitch, I introduce character after character. And when I was doing that, I had my note cards of my different character illustrations done by myself and the amazingly talented Gus Trouth. Um, I had them labeled and in front of me so it was just easy to pick them up in order and then put them back down. And I was the only one who had visual cues, visual materials to kind of spice up the presentation. Uh, you know, patting myself on the back here. But I'm saying that because maybe you want to think about what, what could um, distinguish you from others. Like if you're in a room full of people pitching their stuff, maybe you show up with your own swag, wearing your book's title on your shirt. Make it easy to remember. Give them things that might last in their memory, you know, uh, visual things that get lodged in there. Make it easier for them to remember the name of your book by showing it to them while you say it. Um, and it also helps to really amp up the the enthusiasm. This is a show. Put on a show for them. Um, that's what I took away from my pitch. And uh, so I might be a little rusty here. I have not done this pitch in quite a while. And I'm going to leave some things out because a few things have changed. A few things are different. And I might uh, pause and explain a few things. But. <clears throat> So first off, I don't have it written here, but I would always say something like, hi, I'm Bodie Werner, so nice to meet you. Let's get going, high five. And I would put my hand right to the webcam. And for some reason that just like boosted up my confidence. And it was like, instead of starting off kind of timid, I just came out of the gate with like a, it's virtual, we're not really high-fiving, but I wish we were. And you know, it just like, some of them even high-fived me back. And so it just started us all smiling. Um, so that's a good way to get into a pitch. It's just, 
Hey, I'm Bodie Werner. Thank you so much for taking the, the time to be here. High five. Let's get into it. So, Northport 1999. Hometown heroes up against mad scientists and the monsters they create. This 101,000 word sci-fi horror novel is like, and then I'll leave it blank because I don't think it's, I, I listed a few books. Uh, and then the author's names. A brutal death shakes the small city of Northport, Minnesota. The story, this story of danger, mystery, and intrigue is set in a world of 90s nostalgia and small town charm. Three young adults, Grayson, an introverted orphan, Madeline, a formidable wrestling team captain, and Soren, an innocent scientist, set out to solve the case of their friend's demise. In doing so, they face off with human-animal hybrids and the vile men who created them. Bonding along the way, they find clues linking this death to the disappearance of Grayson's parents. Every time I'm saying a new character, I'm bringing up a new card and showing it to the webcam. Some of the characters that will play into Grayson's journey. Brave Sheriff Blackwood, the town's single mother matriarch, partners with clever FBI Special Agent Smiley to protect the town from the strange dangers they cannot yet imagine. They're met with cover-ups, conspiracies, and espionage. Blackwood's rebellious 12-year-old daughter Luna teams up with the intrepid Mary Catherine from the town's wealthiest family courageously seeking answers, leading them into peril. Will this placid town on the shore of Lake Superior survive the global forces trying to unlock scientific discoveries with terrible consequences? Can our humble heroes summon the strength to fend off the darkness growing beneath their feet? Northport 1999 channels my love for Stephen King, X-Files, Twin Peaks, and Stranger Things. A little about me, my novel, the pilot episode I wrote based on it, and the season one TV show pitch are an official selection to Catalyst and up for awards. I would probably... Okay, I can see, I can see this is not exactly how I wrote it before. But... I wrote a pilot episode screenplay for a separate nonfiction project, which became an official selection to the world's largest TV festival. And I will be up for six awards. So you're talking about things that might bring you some attention in the future, accolades, things that might get you some audience or some news, um, any upcoming articles you might be in. Pamela Cedarquist, a writer for the Netflix's Mindhunter, volunteered to advise me on that script after reading it and I'll be pitching my show to producers and executives at the festival in September and could also pitch Northport 1999. At the time that I wrote this pitch and was giving it, I did not yet know that I would be selected for my, my book would also be selected. So I would have written this differently. I would have said my book and the TV show pitch and pilot episode screenplay based on my book are all official selections to the world's largest TV festival, and I'll be pitching it there in October to executives and producers from around the world. A little bit about my platform. Um, oh, a little bit more about me. I founded a production company. I'm an award-winning indie filmmaker, and I recently, uh, the, the co-founder of the Sundance Film Festival, Serena Catania, interviewed me on her podcast. She said that my novel would make a gripping graphic novel and a great TV series. My platform, I've won X amount of grants for writing this book, including a National Endowment for the Arts grant to complete the second novel. Wow. I have a growing social media audience, and then I list a whole bunch of analytics numbers. Um, I'm going to be on multiple podcasts and blogs in the near future. Though I have a complete and professionally edited draft, and I'm outlining the next books in the series, I'm open to changes, and I love collaborating. I figured they want to hear that because they really... You know, they all want creative input and they all expect it. And anything you say that makes them think you're set and your book is completely done, I've heard from a publisher friend, is a turnoff. And then finally, uh, I sent you an attachment 
or I can send you an attachment uh, with some character and creature illustrations made in collaboration with my illustrator. Thank you for your time and consideration. So this was a version of the pitch that was not completely tight and uh, the exact one that I pitched at the time, but that's because it actually changes every single time I pitch it and get feedback, every single time I adapt it and turn it into a query letter based on somebody's um, requirements and I hear back feedback. But fortunately, all of this hard work has paid off. Um, I'm now working with an independent publisher and gonna publish my novels to them, yay. Um, this has helped me build this community, including on the Patreon and um, also every single time that I wrote this pitch or I verbally shared it, it helped me solidify my articulation ability. <laughs> Int unintentionally pause and have trouble articulating right at that moment. Great. But yeah, um, so that covers pretty much everything. And once this live stream is done, I'm gonna take a little bit of time to put up a link in the description on Facebook, YouTube, and Patreon. So you can sign up for my newsletter and get access to the pitch templates. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I re realized while I was reading my pitch, uh, it does help to memorize it. And I did basically have my pitch entirely memorized when, when I was doing the picturama. But if you don't have it memorized, try to have it as close to the camera as possible, like right up next to your webcam. Me right now, I've got multiple screens and my camera's over there. But that helps so that you're not constantly, you know, shifting your head and attention away. You want to be giving it to the camera looking into their eyes as much as possible. Uh, not, not, not too much. Don't be creepy. Come on now. So yeah, rehearse. Make sure you hit your time limit, your, your character limit, your word limit. Less is more. Have it printed out just in case your computer things get messed up. You know, you don't want to only have it there. Preferably have it memorized. And, you know, have it down enough that you can adjust on the fly. Um, yeah. Now, I do want to talk about the merits of choosing not to go through this rigorous, bureaucratic, at times political, daunting, and uh, commercialized process. Going through a traditional publishing process is turning what, whatever book you want to create into a product and applying it to a market, trying to sell it to people who are going to try to sell it to other people. And, you know, they got to sell it to other people. If they like it, they have to know all the things that are going to sell it down the chain and down the chain and down the chain. And you're going to be giving away creative control. They're going to want to change it. They're going to want to feel their creative vibe fulfilled through your project because where you know who doesn't want to be creative um so if that doesn't sound appealing to you or if it just doesn't work out because there are way more people submitting books to publishers than will ultimately get published then you might want to take the leap of being one of the very few that follows through <clears throat> and self-publishes it is not without merit and um, for me, I'm using a unique method of distributing my novels through Patreon. And it's been really a great way of um, creating the community, and connecting with you guys. And I, I love that. And I couldn't be more grateful for my supporters on Patreon. And let me put up a little shout out to these guys while I continue thanking them. Um, it, you know, without you guys on Patreon, I wouldn't have been able to do all of this work. You guys have certainly been extremely helpful and it keeps me inspired all the time. So if you want to check it out, there's a free version on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Bodhi the Movie Maker. You can also uh, get access to my novel there and a, sh a short film based on it, which is exclusively available there. 
You'll also get a 15% off code for merch, including this hazmat bomber jacket. Eh. I can't tell. Can you see? Can you, can I? Eh. 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 Uh, there we go. It's a little hard to... Okay. Cool, cool. Uh, it's been a lot of information. I'm going to put the links out now. Please let me know if you have any questions. I know I just said a lot of stuff. But, um, you know, the world needs your stories. And all this information, hopefully it helps you tell yours. Get them out in the world. And uh, it's, a, it's a process. Pitching and you know, learning how to hone your storytelling ability. You know, it can be antithetical. You write a 100,000 word novel and then you gotta distill that effort into maybe 30 seconds of eye contact and passionate, enthusiastic connection with a human being through a webcam, you know? So that kind of stuff takes practice. And the more you do it, the more you'll be able to do it on the fly and adjust and improvise and ad lib and have that human to human contact, meaningful contact. One of the important things to mention is if you're pitching something to somebody, that is the door opener. It's not the finish line. So you don't want to rush. You don't want to jam all of your expectation and desire and, and enthusiasm to get your book published into that. No, this is you introducing yourself and piquing their interest, getting them invested, getting them started on the journey that is having a business relationship with you. You want to be somebody that's cool and nice and interesting and fun to talk to, so, you know, it's a multifaceted relationship, but, you know, don't be desperate. Don't try to convince them that your book is amazing if they don't seem interested. Um, if they say, you know, I'm not interested, that's their prerogative. It, you didn't lose. You uh, checked one more pitch off the book. If you get a rejection letter good put hang it on the wall print it out 